how to get going and I didn't introduce you. Oh, right. Yes. I'll let you talk first. <laughs> okay. So we're recording. My name is Sam Harlow and I am the online learning librarian for UNCJ libraries, as well as a liaison librarian to various departments. So um, we came up with the idea to create a series of webinar for the UNCG community on research and applications a couple of years ago. So welcome to this series. In this series, different librarians will cover topics on UNCG libraries resources and research tools. They are 30 minute webinars that are recorded in WebEx meetings where we are now this virtual room and they are placed on the library web to web page YouTube where they will be closed captions and not have participant data available for the public. So here is the link to the page where all of our webinar series lives from the library um, and then there's a tab for research and application. You will also get an email with the recording as well. So just to cover some logistical things before we get started um, about how this webinar is going to run, you can mute your audio during the presentation by clicking the audio button on the right uh, to, of your name to mute yourself while Leah is speaking. And then um, you can unmute yourself at the end in order to uh, participate in a conversation or ask questions if you need to. So I'm good. If you have any questions throughout the webinar, you can put them in the chat at the bottom um, or any technical issues, put them in the chat and I will cover that as well and work with you one on one. So Leah can keep presenting. Uh, if you do not have a microphone, you can also ask all your questions in the chat and I will read them out loud. So no worries about that. So if you have any technical issues, you can email me at slharlow at uncg.edu. I'm gonna put that in the chat. I actually don't have an office phone. And also remember worst case scenario, this is being recorded uh, and we will send you the recording after the fact as well. So do not fear. So does it, if anyone has any questions about the logistics, please put them in the chat now um, as I am about to introduce our host for today. Okay, so our host is Leah Leininger, our health science uh, librarian here at UNCG Libraries, and she is going to be talking about evaluating journals, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So Leah, I'm going to mute myself and you can get going. All right, thank you so much, Sam, and thank you everybody for joining us. I am the liaison librarian to um, several of the health sciences here at UNCG, and I definitely recognize some names. Uh, of participants in this webinar. Some of y'all are in my liaison areas in nursing or nutrition. Um, and my point of view on this whole evaluating journals thing is going to be sort of a health sciences librarian point of view, but I think it, it uh, can be generalizable beyond that as well. So I wanna let everybody know that these slides um, will be available after the presentation. Um, and I did put Creative Commons license on them. So if you want to use these slides yourself or adapt them, please feel free to. And just um, so that we have an idea of uh, kind of background and who we're sharing the room with, um, could you type into the chat box which department you're with or which subject area you're in? We had such a nice representation in the RSVP poll. A lot of the health sciences, some people from outside the health sciences, and even some people from within the libraries as well. Hey, MLIS, that's fantastic. Great, yes. So um, just to let you know uh, what I'm planning to cover today, um, I am gonna talk a little bit about open access because I think um, some of us might not deal with all of this stuff from day to day. So just a quick introduction to open access. We're gonna to look together at the directory of open access journals. I'm gonna talk a little bit about predatory or questionable uh, publishing practices. And I am gonna mention journal evaluation checklists. Everybody likes a good checklist, including me. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna to point to one of the ones that I like and I'll show it to you. Um, and then we're really gonna talk about investigating the publisher of the journal using external sources and then looking at a journal website. So all of these are really useful things to do and really important if you're thinking about contributing your content, your research, your work to a journal. First of all, of course, open access is, um, is when scholarly is made freely available online. And I know scholarly is kind of a funny word, but 
Um, I usually take it to mean created by and for scholars. A lot of times this is some sort of research output, but it could be theory. It could be um, some sort of practice, some other things. Um, so not only is it made of freely available online, but there are no login barriers. Also, um, for open access, there should be some sort of a license that makes it clear that readers are allowed to reuse it. Now, hopefully the author should retain ownership, but a license such as Creative Commons, that's um, those are the licenses most commonly used, those can really specify how the content can be used and they can make it really, really clear to the, the users, this is what you can do with the stuff. Important for publishers that they be able to kind of keep the lights turned on. It costs money to post journals online, to pay editors and to do all sorts of things. So how in the world could making articles freely available online be funded? There are a couple of models. Um, in some cases, the publishers continue charging a subscription. So individuals or um, institutions that want all of the most recent uh, articles from a journal will pay a subscription fee to the to the publisher. Um, and in those cases, sometimes a publisher um, will make the articles freely available, open access after one year. So there's a bit of a delay. Um, and in some cases, the authors are allowed to post um, a pre-publication version or pre-print of the article, um, maybe on an, in an institutional um, repository like NC Docs, which is what we have here. Um, and in some cases, the, there are article processing charges that are charged to the author or to the institution. Now, um, I definitely see how this is necessary and it is very common practice. Some of you might be scratching your heads at this one a little bit if you haven't heard of it. And if you are, I sort of agree with you. It, it seems a little strange to charge the researcher money after they've already put in the work in order for them to disseminate that work, but that is common practice, just so you know. tools when we're talking about open access journals. One of the things that we talk about really commonly is the directory of open access journals. It's a community curated list of peer reviewed open access journals. So freely available online, you can search it for the a journal title or browse subject lists. And we're going to do that now. But in order to make the list, um, journal publishers certainly do have to um, show that they have met some criteria um, in terms of clearly communicating how they publish their articles um, to deal with authors. But let's start with just a search. DOAJ, or the Directory of Open Access Journals, is linked in a lot of sites, or you can just search it online and um, you can get to it that way. And if you have a specific journal in mind, um, what you can do is, you know, uncheck the article search. You can type the journal title here, or you can browse to see which journals have made this community curated list of really thousands of journals. So if I browse subjects listed, and um, I'm going to hit the sideways arrow next to medicine. There are a lot of um, medical and healthcare specialties in here. I'm just going to click on nursing. I don't see a huge result right now, for instance, a feedback from the website, but if I scroll up, it tells me, oh, hey, there are a lot of records that have been found with this subject. So I'm going to click view. It's going to um, give me a list of journals and articles that have this subject. I'm kind of interested just in journals at the moment. Keep in mind, these are journals that have reported and have listed on their website that they have a peer review process and that they're open access, they're freely available for anybody to search and browse. This really is just sort of a clearinghouse, not just, but it is a clearinghouse to um, learn about some of these want to you can click on an individual title or you can continue um, you can continue looking at some of these filters so for instance what type of peer review does the journal report that they use and and there are some different types of process there what country um, does the journal come out of uh, 
what sort of license is the content made available? And you can see a lot of these are Creative Commons licenses. Are there article processing charges? And that's a quick way to, to kind of dive in here. Are these journals going to charge a fee to the researcher or their institution? Um, I'm going to collapse a few of these. I am going to go to, um, excuse me, journal has DOAG seal. Every, um, every journal listed in the directory of open access journal has to have met some criteria in terms of they make their content available online, they have a website, they have um, some description of peer review, quality control, the publication process, they're clear about whether they charge fees or not, some journals go above and beyond that and have additional sort of good practices, good publishing practices. I'm going to click on DOAG seal to get to some of those um, sort of extra, extra quality journals. Um, and this is a brief record for BMC nursing. If I click on it, you can see that it gives me a little bit of information. Um, definitely the link to the journal homepage. Um, that a researcher would want to know, am I going to be charged money if I want to publish in this journal? Um, or are there article processing charges? Is there a waiver policy? That's a big deal. Um, one, of the, one of the things that we want to guard against in open access is um, bias entering the dissemination process. If a researcher can't afford to disseminate their, their materials, we don't want their research to be suppressed just because they can't pay a lot of money. So there are things like waivers really important. Um, there are links to um, the publisher's website, the journal website, that talk about the publishing process, the peer review process, the aims and the scope, author instructions. That's huge. If you're thinking about submitting to a journal, you really want to go directly to that website and read the fine print, what the publisher says they're going to do with your manuscript. Is, if we click a little more, you can click more here. These are some best practices that earned um, this journal, the, the special seal. So they use DOIs, they use a plagiarism checker, um, and the journal actually reports that it um, archives their articles and it lists services where this content will continue to be available and so on and so forth. The directory of open access journals, it functions as a whitelist for um, open access journals. So basically, if a journal has reached a point where they can um, publish reliably and communic communicate clearly with authors and researchers, they can apply and get a listing in the directory of open access journals. Back to my thing over here. I want to point out that um, DOAGE does not assess article quality. Um, if you do see some questionable activities from a publisher or from a journal, and they are listed in DOAGE, um, you can report them to DOAGE. So, when I say questionable, um, what I'm really trying to say without saying it out loud is predatory. So, there are some publishers that mislead or deal unfairly with researchers. And these are some things that happen. They do, um, there are a variety of questionable practices or unfair practices that can happen. But um, it starts with something that might seem like just an annoyance. The unsolicited email asking you to submit a manuscript and maybe you find out later that there's a fee you need to pay or they ask you to be a, um, a peer reviewer for their journal and you find out later that your name and your picture are on the website as a member of an editorial board that gets down into it into the identity theft part of it. Um, they might if you um, they might mislead about things like impact factor. So they might claim that they have a certain impact factor and just so you know, librarians are super picky about this kind of thing. That's a sort of a journal ranking impact factor is is a proprietary measure um, of a journal that's created 
by Clarivate Analytics. We don't subscribe to it at our library, the journal citation reports. Um, and I would say just as a if if you see a journal posting impact factors on their website, always take that with a grain of salt. Um, might not be the the Clarivate um, number. Um, it might they might have calculated it using some other data. They may or may not be clear about that. Um, other things that ways that a publisher might mislead or exaggerate uh, their journal or their publishing practices is maybe to claim indexing in journals or claim indexing in databases. Say our journal is contained in this database, this database, that source, that source. Um, so that's one thing that you you kind of want to look out for. Um, that you might not find out till later is maybe the publisher doesn't give a whole lot of quality control. Maybe little to no peer review um, is arranged. And honestly, if you're in the um, if you're in a discipline and you're looking at a journal that claims to be you know, publishing scholarship in that discipline. One thing for you to do is just look at the articles. If it's open access, you should be able to open an article and look at it. Is this the kind of article that you would read, that you would cite, that you would use? Um, and some authors really do go so above and beyond that um, their eventual publication does pretty well, um, even without the peer review. But often if a, if a journal is not providing good peer review, that's gonna become clear if you eyeball one or two articles, you'll be able to see um, that maybe these aren't the these aren't the types of articles that you would use yourself or that you would want to cite. Well, one other thing that's a that can become a big issue is sometimes publisher refuse retraction requests. They might actually charge fees for them, and sometimes they state this explicitly on their website. So, I would say always, always look at the author agreement, look at the instructions for authors, so you don't end up with oh. I changed my mind. I don't want this article included in your journal. Wait a minute. You're telling me I have to pay $800 if I want it removed. So there can be some scary things that happen there. And, um, and I'm going to ask, has anybody heard of other predatory or questionable practices? Really, I'm trying to scare your pants off here. No, not really. I'm trying to report on some of the things that I have heard about from researchers. I'm going to keep moving. Yeah. Some things with books. And yeah, one of my librarian colleagues says those are the main ones I see. There are a few others, but those are biggies. What happens if you're wondering, um, is a publisher or a journal questionable? Well, for one thing, um, yes, you can ask your librarian, you know, does, is this a questionable journal? We won't always be able to tell you whether a journal publisher is going to deal fairly with you or not. But we can um, point you to the kinds of things that I'm pointing out during this webinar. Um, and we can lead you through some of these steps. So first of all, don't assume that all publishers in India or in Africa will lie or deal unfairly with you. Um, there are some really good initiatives that talk about research and predatory publishing from a global South perspective. So um, I link to one of those down at the bottom of this um, slide. Also do be suspicious if you get an email invitation. So every single time I've heard of somebody getting an email solicitation, it's it's been spam and it's been kind of a bad idea for the person to accept. So um, if you're new in your career, if you don't have a big research profile, if you get an email, um, like this asking for your scholarly work, it's probably spam. Even if you're well established, you're still going to get these emails. And if you're wondering what this kind of thing looks like, um, I, I linked to a blog post about this. It's really, really good. If you're wondering about a specific journal, look at some external info. Um, we already looked at DOAGE. We'll look at it again for a specific journal in a little bit. Um, also look at the journal website itself information provided. Specifics on external sources that you want to use if you're investigating a journal. 
Um, so you definitely want to search DOAGE. Also, this might sound a little silly, but yes, do search online for the publisher name or the journal name. Researchers, if they get burned by a publisher, they are going to post about it. So you will see um, things mentioned in ResearchGate, on blogs, sometimes entire journal articles are written or news articles, um, or maybe something from the Chronicle of Higher Education. So doing just a quick search for the, the publisher name or the journal name can pull up red flags. If you see something like that, do not um, work with that publisher. I'll just put it that way. And of course, pay attention to any expectations from your funder. If you're thinking about submitting to a journal, just pay attention to what the expectations are. Um, for instance, for years and years now, the NIH has said that if you accept grant money from us you um, and you end up um, publishing results of your grant funded research in a peer reviewed journal, results must be made available. That has to become open access within 12 months. So you don't want to get stuck between a rock and a hard place. Your funder might have other expectations in terms of things to think about. Some journal evaluation checklists out there. Um, Think Check Submit is one that I like really well. Um, Manka et al. have got a really good one too. I'm just going to come over to the check. It is linked all over the place. Um, it's pretty well known. And I usually just click on the check area here. So a lot of the things I've mentioned already. Look at the journal itself. Um, have you heard of it? use these articles? Have you used these articles or would you? Um, can you clearly contact or identify the journal? Can you tell what type of peer review um, this journal uses? Are the articles indexed in databases that you use? Um, are there clear statements about fees that are going to be charged? And then there are a list of places to check, um, including the Directory of Open Access Journals. here. Jumping around a little bit. Okay, so um, I'm going to take us through looking at um, an example it's called the Journal of Nursing and Health Studies. And let's see, I'm going to follow my own advice. I'm going to start with, um, well, Actually, let's start on their website because I'm going to assume I know nothing about this journal. Are they open access or not? So I'll just do a quick search to, to see what I can find out about them. I found it. <laughs> Here we go. Ooh, and there's an archive. That's sounding pretty good. Open this up. Um, the first thing I'm going to do is read about this journal a little bit. They have an ISSN. That's a unique number to this journal. That's kind of a good sign. Um, it does say this is an open access journal, which is great. This is a forum for healthcare delivery, organization, management, workforce policy, and research methods relevant to nursing, midwifery, or health related professions. Okay, as a librarian, so far, this description um, raises a few red flags for me. This is really broad. So um, a lot of times that might be a little bit questionable, um, but at least they have a little bit of information about what kinds of things they welcome. We can look at and see which topics they include. Wow, this is, this is really, really broad. <laughs> God. Most journals have sort of a narrower scope than this. It does say open access though. So I am going to copy this and we'll see if it comes up in, does it meet my minimum bar for taking it seriously, which is an entry doage. No, it is not. It's not there. That's sad. So from this point on, I'm probably not going to take this super seriously, but um, it wasn't that quick. Uh, but I should let you know that, of course, you want to look at the author guidelines in case you're really curious. Um, testing charges, article preparation guidelines. Wow, they have a 
several paragraphs about how you're supposed to prepare your, your manuscript. If you've submitted someplace before, you'll know that a lot of times they, there's a, there are more expectations than that, but that's okay. Um, they are giving a little bit more than that. Examples and so on and so forth. Here's some other information. So I would just say if I, if you don't see it in DOAGE, you know, probably not something you want to submit to, but also current issue. If you, even if you do see it in DOAGE or, or if you just want to pursue it, make sure you open an article or two and look at the content and evaluate it. Is this something that you would really use, you would really think about? Super quick, but um, many of the questions that come to me, uh, the journals kind of get derailed just that quickly. Does anybody have any questions so far about kind of saving your time and investigating a journal? Just to look at. I flashed think check submit up there pretty quickly, but I see that Sam has put it in the chat. You can look at it later if you'd like. So as people are thinking about questions, Leah, I have a question. Um, I've heard you mention before, you know, that the use of predatory journals, people don't like that as much. Um, but if you, if someone um, is asking questions about predatory journals, are there, is there another phrase that is being used in, um, out there and that kind of thing? Um, yeah, that's a, okay, so that's a good question. I think a lot of people in scholarly communication are sort of moving towards the phrase questionable practices just because it gets across the idea that the publisher might not be doing a great job. You know, if the question, if the publisher engages in questionable practices, then they might not have the highest quality journal. They might not be um, very clear about what they're going to do, what they're going to deliver. Um, and maybe, but it doesn't assume intent. So maybe that's, in order to take people's money or take advantage of them, but maybe it is because they are a researcher in their field and they're super focused on producing the journal and perhaps they don't pay as much attention as they should to good journal practices. So questionable practices is, is kind of a nice overall term that kind of covers any sort of intent. Like this just isn't a great way that this publisher is moving forward. Great, thank you. So um, Doreen asked if the impact factor is subjectively determined, what is the most ideal way to measure the journal quality? Oh, well, okay. So impact factor um, is different people um, use the word impact factor to describe different things. If we're talking about the impact factor um, that is from Clarivet Analytics, it is fairly objective. It's based on data from the Web of Science database. It's a calculation at the um, journal level of how many, um, I mean, I'm sorry, this is a gross overgeneralization, but basically how many times the average journal has been cited in a year and it looks over several years. So um, it's an attempt to be, um, it is based on Web of Science data, which is proprietary. Um, but when you go out and start looking at journals and look at the websites and see what um, the publishers are reporting on, some people use the term impact factor and they'll say calculated from, and they'll give some other description, different calculations that are used, different source of data. And um, I don't know, I keep, that is a huge second part of your question, the ideal way to measure journal quality. Still don't have that. To be honest, um, there are different journal ranking systems that are used. So um, I also put a link in there, Leah, to some of the stuff um, we've done with uh, scholarship metrics. Um, and Leah does yeah. great stuff with that as well. So if Leah is your liaison, you should definitely uh, meet with her. So Alyssa asked, I had some connection issues at first, so you may have covered this. Is there a cap or max APC, um, what is it, author? Um, yeah, um, uh, article there. processing yeah. charge. Before yeah. we consider it excessive, or is that sort of dependent on the field publisher prominence? 
question. So I love the nuanced way that you asked this question. Um, so, so am I, I would consider journal reputation and, and or publisher practices before I look at article publishing charges. Um, ironically, um, some of the publishers that, that have lower article processing charges tend to be the predatory ones. That's just a trend that a lot of people have noticed. Very, maybe a very small amount is charged, but absolutely no peer review is done. And so maybe the author isn't, or the researcher isn't out much money, but, um, but you know, their, their, their name goes down, their reputation is kind of used to prop up this, um, this journal that maybe isn't very good. Um, it doesn't have a lot of other high quality um, contents. Um, and I personally do think that a lot of the article processing charges in health sciences and life sciences are excessive. And these, these are from reputable open access publishers. So it's pretty common for me to hear from researchers who are looking at article processing charges of $3,000. And that's from a really big publisher, maybe, maybe an Elsevier journal or um, some other publisher that's going to do a very sterling job and they're very reputable and they will have a, a full publication process, but a lot of money. So um, I consider that excessive. So we're right at 1232. Um, I am happy to stay in here and continue to have the conversation, uh, but if people have to go, uh, I put in the chat that our next uh, Research and application webinar will be hosted by our science liaison librarian, Megan Carlton, on November 4th at 1130 a.m. on Scopus. Um, I'm going to drop in the um, chat the link to it. Um, so uh, Stephanie wants to ask a question. So if you want to turn your audio on, you can or put it in the chat. And just, oh, hey, yeah. Can you can hear you? Okay, great. Um, I just had a follow up question on the DOAD seal. Um, I noticed that on the example Leah showed us, um, it, there were very few out of the, the total number of results, you know, that um, actually had that seal. And I was wondering, so if it does not have that seal, um, can we take that to mean anything negative about that? Or does it just mean like they haven't gotten to review that journal in that depth yet? Or, you know, like, does it, they've already reviewed it and said, no, this doesn't really meet these extra standards. So, okay, good question. And I can't tell you what's going on behind the scenes where the journal is in the process, but, um, the seal just means that the publisher has gone to some extra steps to provide additional information and make additional arrangements. So, um, at the end of at the end of my slides, um, you know there are some there are some links, and one of them is related to this. Um, some uh, some journals, some publishers um, just need a a little support in working up from um, providing basic information to authors and a basic process to being, um, you know, maybe a little more advanced and archiving their articles and, and doing things like that. So um, you can look on the DOAGE website for exactly the difference between what the seal means versus just what basic entry means. That would be the first thing I would say. And secondly, if you're interested in this, where our journals um, in this process. There's a really nice um, list of um, criteria that um, that INASP has created, um, and that's an organization that this is again a little bit of a tangent, but they are trying to help um, journal publishers in the developing world kind of um, meet global publishing standards. So they've they've created um, a support structure and some criteria. So if you're interested, look at the DOAGE website. And also I would I would definitely encourage you to look at INASP as well. Sorry, there are extra resources for the health sciences here. 
Great. So, um, Leo, would you mind sharing with me that uh, link and I'll put it on the um, LibGuide and send it out with the recording so that y'all have all these links as well as the recording? Absolutely. Okay, so um, are there any other questions? Feel free. Okay, I'm taking the silence um, as that we're wrapping up. So thank you, Leah, for joining us. I hope that um, you all come to other in the series as well. Like I said, our last one for this semester is on Scopus by Megan Carlton, our science liaison librarian. Uh, Scopus is one of the largest citation and indexing databases. Uh, so be sure to come to that one. It will be fun. I know a lot of y'all here are um, kind of STEM related. And then we also run an online learning and innovation one. So November 13th, our next one is on Canvas and analytics by um, one of our amazing ITS employees, Amanda Shipman. So definitely check that out. Um, and then we do have one in December for that on tips for lecture and web capture if you're into online learning and innovation. So thank you all for coming. Uh, hopefully we'll see you around and uh, be on the lookout for the recording within the next week. Thanks, Leah. Thank you, everybody.